Good evening and welcome to Parkstone Baptist Church, Mance, for this Maundy Thursday 2021. It's good to have you here with me in this way, even if we can't be together in the usual ways. Anyway, let's make a beginning. Words of Jesus from Matthew 26. All this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Quite a bit lately on Sunday mornings we've been thinking about Matthew's loose ends as I call them. Some of them very obvious, Matthew draws attention to them in his particular ways. Some of them not so obvious and we have to think a little bit harder and know our Bibles better apart from anything else. Um, but Matthew throughout his Gospel, particularly in the early chapters, but he never stops doing it, gathers up these loose ends of scripture in order to tie them in to the life and work of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Matthew will be doing the same again uh, over the course of the events of this evening and the next day. I'm going to begin uh, by reading uh, from Matthew's Gospel, uh, from Matthew 26, from verse 26 through to that verse 56 that I read just now. During the meal, Jesus took some bread in his hands. He blessed the bread and broke it. Then he gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and eat it. This is my body. Jesus picked up a cup of wine and gave thanks to God. He then gave it to his disciples and said, Take this and drink it. This is my blood. And with it God makes his agreement with you, his covenant, his promise. It, my blood, will be poured out so that many people will have their sins forgiven. From now on, I'm not going to drink any wine until I drink new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus said to his disciples, During this very night all of you will reject me. As the scriptures say, one of those ends, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised to life, I will go to Galilee ahead of you. Peter spoke up, even if all the others reject you, I never will. Jesus replied, I promise you that before a rooster crows tonight, you will say three times that you don't know me. But Peter said, even if I have to die with you, I will never say I don't know you. And all the others said the same thing. Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. When they got there, he told them, sit here while I go over there and pray. Jesus took along Peter and the two brothers, James and John. He was very sad and troubled. And he said to them, I am so sad that I feel as if I am dying. My soul is distressed unto death. Stay here and keep awake with me. Jesus walked on a little way, and then he knelt with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, don't make me suffer by having me drink from this cup. But do what you want, and not what I want came back and found his disciples sleeping. So he said to Peter, Can't any of you stay awake with me for just one hour? Stay awake and pray that you won't be tested. You want to do what is right, but you are weak. Again Jesus went to pray and said, My father, if there is no other way, and I must suffer, I will still do what you want. Jesus came back and found them sleeping again. They simply couldn't keep their eyes open. He left them. 
and prayed the same prayer once more. Finally, Jesus returned to his disciples and said, Are you still sleeping and resting? The time has come for the Son of Man to be handed over to sinners. Get up, let's go. The one who will betray me is already here. There are many ways through the gospel in which we know of the Lord of the, know of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, not least here in this passage where Jesus spends time with his disciples on Passover Eve before the cross uh, the way in which he bears with them you know he he knew them he knew the hard trial that was coming upon them uh, as much even more for him of course um, but he had such compassion on them, you know, not in a kind of weak, wishy-washy kind of way. It was a, come on, come on, you know, you need, you need to think of yourselves, take care for yourselves. Because he wasn't going to fool, but, but they were, they were. Uh, and he loved them so, <laughs> he loved them so. Words of W.Y. Fullerton from his hymn, I cannot tell why he whom angels worship, come back to angels later, should set his love upon the souls of men, or why as shepherd he should seek the wanderers to bring them back, they know not how or when. But this I know, that he was born of Mary when Bethlehem's manger was his only home, and that he lived at Nazareth and laboured, and so the Saviour, Saviour of the world, has come. We pray, Lord, as we gather, meet with us, alone or with another, be with us. Strengthen us to be with you, that we may keep and watch, that we may keep watch and pray, on this night when you did not sleep but stayed awake for us. In this short time, may we be mindful of long time, stretching ahead into a day of no rest until you bowed your head and entrusted your spirit to your father's care and faithful friends came and laid aside their fears to lay your body in the tomb. Beaten not beaten, bruised, but not broken, pierced for our transgressions, yet wounds freely accepted out of uttermost love for our sakes. Saviour of the world, shepherd and saviour of our souls, Jesus, receive our humble prayer and grateful praise. Amen. Very often on Maundy Thursday we find ourselves in the upper room where Jesus washes the feet of his disciples in a bowl here on the table and breaks bread with them. Sometimes we go to the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus faces the cross before the cross and all alone as Abelard sang in his hymn goes forth to die. We usually, rather sadly these, these last years, just a very few, sometimes outnumbered by the good folk of Buckland Road who've come to join us or we've joined them. But we've had in our small way memorable times, which is as it should be on this night when Jesus picked up bread, passed it around and said, do this in remembrance of me. There is, however, a wider scene, a bigger canvas, the room or garden, and for once, since we have opportunity not to do some of the things we might normally be able to do with people around and about us, for once, let's take a look at that bigger picture. And I've got some my horrible pictures and scrolls uh, coming in for the moment. It's said of our Lord Jesus Christ that he entered the world as no one has ever entered it, that he lived in the world as no one has ever lived in it, and he left this world as no one has ever left it. Those are three things well said. 
After all, if you consider each statement in turn, even for a moment, something will pop up and attach itself to it. If you're prepared to do a bit more than think of something pops up, but do a bit of <laughs> thinking, studying, reading your Bibles, there will be more. Anyway, as with the first, a pop-up. He entered the world as none has ever entered it. What's the first thought to enter your mind? Well, minds of the earnest, honest inquiry of a young woman engaged to be married who innocently, yet not ignorantly, faithfully, not doubtfully, asked, how will this be? You know, what will be the means of this, since I am a virgin? The angel Gabriel answered Mary, uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. I knew this was going to happen because uh, I folded it over and I really shouldn't have done I should have done this one differently. But anyway, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. My first pop-up thought then is of the means of our Lord's entrance into the world as no one has ever entered it. In Wesley's words from a hymn that I'm not going to sing, it's got a very odd meter. There's only one tune that I know of to it. If I remember rightly, it's St. Dorothea. It's certainly not in any Baptist hymn book over the years, I don't think. Um, I don't know how many people know that tune today, um, so I'm certainly not going to sing it. But I'm going to read the words glory be to god on high and peace on earth descend god comes down he bows the sky it's like a rainbow in reverse <laughs> was it he bows the sky no it's he bows the sky and shows himself our friend god the invisible appears god the invisible appears what a paradox God the blessed, the great I am, the one self-existent being in the whole universe, sovereign, free, uh, our Lord, dwelling in this world of tears, and Jesus is his name. Now don't rush on to the second statement, he lived in the world as no one has ever lived in it. Let's just linger a little bit with he entered the world as no one has ever entered it. Wait a while, think a little. What else pops up? What else comes to mind? To my mind come the words of Gospel John and the Word who was in the beginning, who was with God and was God, through whom the world and all things in it were made, who is the life and light of the whole human race. You know, nobody other than God could be that. I'm not going to have a discussion here with Jehovah's Witness friends, but anyway, there we are. There are all sorts of reasons why I, they are, in my view, most definitely wrong in their translation of this part of the Gospel. But I shouldn't be digressing, should I? But anyway, who is the life and light of the whole human race, the only God, the only begotten God, became flesh and made his home among us tabernacled amongst us, pitched his tent among us in a human body. Thus my second thought is of our Lord's incarnation, of his coming into this material world in the same fleshy material, this stuff with which we are born, with which we live and with which we die. Wesley again, he whom angels all adored will be back to angels their maker and their king is their news the humble lord whose name to earth they bring emptied of his majesty of his dazzling glory shorn being source begins to be oh my word another one of those paradoxes being source begins to be and God himself is born. Oh my. He entered our world as no one has ever entered it. Two thoughts quickly followed. Virgin birth and incarnation. Two thoughts joined by more if and when we stop to study more. And maybe with more time on our hands than usual this Easter weekend, 
we can stop to think more of Jesus who entered the world as no one has ever entered it and consider not only the how, when and where, but also the significant why. Why did the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, enter the world as no one has ever entered it? C. Uh, back to Wesley again. The eternal Son of God, a mortal Son of Man. <laughs> a paradox again. Set to walk this earthly road whom heaven cannot contain. Stand amazed, you heavens at this. See, the Lord of earth and skies, humbled to the dust he is, and in a manger lies. Now, I have a large, thick, densely written book on my table, and I'm looking and I'm realising that I haven't got it here at all. It must be somewhere on my shelves or stacked somewhere, and I'm desperately looking around. All I've got is its companion volume by Professor Tom Torrance of Edinburgh University, a blessed memory. This is his work on the atonement, the person and work of Christ. But there's a volume that precedes it, which is on the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, I've spotted it now. I was looking for the wrong, the wrong cover. Here it is. It's not quite so big, but it is densely written, which, yes, certainly Thomas, sorry, Thomas Torrance is, uh, is, uh, is uh, known for, um, but also, uh, you know, I am dense, and I must admit, uh, reading a page at a time is an exercise in itself, uh, because you just have to keep on going back and back and back and really, really working both of these marvellous, marvellous books, books in, sorry, books, what was I saying? Anyway, I've lost it. But Tom would have been the first to admit that his lectures were only a primer, a basic introduction to the great question that Anselm, uh, who lived in the 12th century principally, Anselm of Canterbury raised and strove to answer, why did God become man? Cur Deus Homo. It, it's the question for which angels long to see the full answer, because God never became an angel. God became man, one of us, not one of them. Do you remember those other words of Wesley from his hymn, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's love? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depths of love divine. In vain, and Christina Rossetti's words, love came down at Christmas, love all lovely, love divine. The divine love in fully divine and fully human expression, um, something that we can only talk about in terms of the hypostatic union, to use the proper terms, which is, well, the fullness of God and the fullness of humanity of a human being um, together uh, forever um, in ways that are hard to express, but I believe important to confess. Uh, it, it was announced was announced by angels. It may even, as Wesley imagined, have astounded angels, astonished them, amazed them, but it's not yet fully understood by angels. After all, it was for us, us, he hung and suffered there. A mortal son of man, we heard Wesley say. Even as he lay in a manger there and his legs took him here and there, it was for us, it wasn't for angels. Angels with the rest of creation must wait with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God with bated breath. As Paul says in Romans 8, even angels must take their proper place in God's redemption plan. Even so, the divine order of salvation doesn't relegate angels to the role of anxious waiters any more than it made them passive spectators when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Saviour appeared, Paul's words, in order to save us, though he didn't mention angels in that breath. As if to say that Christ entered the world, 
lived in the world and left the world as no other. Behold, behold, love that word. The scripture says angels came and were attending to him. Do you remember when? Matthew drew attention to this at a specific moment, at the end of 40 days of fasting, at the end of the devil's final tempting suggestions, that trio at the end, doesn't mean there weren't others before, as hunger and weakness threatened to make an end of him, <laughs> in a sense, physically so. Angels came and were ministering to him. Some of our Bible translations and versions say angels came and ministered to him as if this were a one-off, a special occasion, a singular instance. But they miss Matthew's message uh, and his, and his uh, grammar. Uh, the Son of God, for all that he was tried and tested by means of a fallen angel who lay claim, false claim, to divine authority, you know, I'll give you all this if you bow down and worship me, ha ha, was nonetheless superior to the angels and served by angels then and not only then. He lived as no other lived, uh, attended by angels as befits the Son of God. Whoever said Jesus entered the world, lived in it, and left in it as no one ever has, and I'm racking my brains to think who it was. I think it was a little book called The Glory of Christ. It was a wonderful book about the life, person, and work of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. And the author's name is it Peter White? Anyway, it kind of eludes me, but but I am grateful to whoever it was planted that in my head a long, long time ago. Um, but whoever said Jesus entered the world, lived in it, and left in it as no one ever has, had much more in mind than the presence of angels. However, that doesn't mean that they meant an absence, an absence of angels. For his entrance into the world to his departure, our Lord Jesus was always attended by angels. That angels are not always mentioned doesn't mean that angels were not always in attendance or having their attention on him, as befitted Jesus and as behoved them. Listen to the letter to the Hebrews as it gathers up and ties together some of the many loose ends of the Old Testament scriptures. To which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? Psalm 2. Or again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Would seraph be means flame, a burning flame, for example. But of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of, upright, of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness behind, sorry, beyond your companions. God, your God, has anointed you. Yeah, that is Messiah, Christ. But he's addressed as, your throne, O God, is forever. Hmm. And Hebrews joins much more such loose ends in Jesus before hitting the highest note of all. And to which of the angels has God ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Psalm 110, and words that the apostles love to repeat and preach about Jesus. Concluding, are they, angels that is, Hebrews 1, not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. Angels are servants. And angels were sent out to serve the Saviour, and not only in the desert, but before he entered the world, as we know, because you remembered not so long ago at Christmas, to announce his coming and his work to Mary, uh, 
chapter 1 verse 26 which I forgot to put in the notes to Joseph in Matthew 1 and the verses I didn't forget to put and shepherds in Luke 2 and again verses I didn't forget to put wow as he lived in the world he was attended by angels or angels attended to him uh, that's not to say that angels kept up popping here and there I've got a bit of a blank canvas there you might say but it doesn't mean that they weren't there if angels had appeared here there and everywhere um, people's minds in Galilee and Jerusalem wouldn't have sought Jesus would they it'd be the same today it doesn't take much to set people off chasing rumours of angels any more than it does to chase aliens, UFOs or conspiracy theories. John's faithful, behold the Lamb, would have been swamped by a chorus of behold the angel and a stampede to follow. <laughs> you know, rather than people rushing off to, to see and to get to know and to follow and... and, and uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <laughs> well, I'd know. Well, quite probably they'd have ended up in more sin by chasing all sorts of rumours of angels. Instead, there's an occasional hint, an occasional hint of the angel service of the servant's son who came to be the world's saviour like that glimpse in the wilderness given us by Matthew of two things in the last verse of his account of Jesus' wilderness trials, where first, you already remembered it, Matthew tells us of the devil's attempt on Jesus, when Satan, the Satan, adversary, enemy, was resolutely, resolutely put in face by Jesus, put in face, sorry, put in place by Jesus, Matthew said, then the devil left him. And if you take Matthew to mean that the devil left Jesus alone from that time on and never tested Jesus again, think again. Because when did our Lord Jesus never face trials of many kinds, many more than we, and to depths and extents that none of us uh, know? Was it when crowds wanted to seize him and make him king on the day that followed the feeding of the 5,000, that's in John 6. Was it when crowds sought him out as they did and invaded his personal time and space at the end of a long day? Oh my. Was it whenever disciples, oh you wretched lot, were sluggish to learn and slow to believe, but super fast to fight over which of them was the most important? Cool, wouldn't you have liked to have stuff there is and was it whenever scribes pharisees and sadducees tried to trick and trap him and forgive me if i sounded a bit downer on disciples because i wouldn't have been any different we must always read the gospels from the point of view of those jesus came to seek save and serve and not from the point of view of the lord jesus christ you get that was it when the crucifixion crowd you know the awful trial when the crucifixion crowd and its leaders scorned him saying save yourself <laughs> if well that goes right back to the wilderness doesn't it if you are the son of god come down from the cross jump off the temple let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him yeah like the devil would have done huh he trusts in god let god now deliver him if he desires him, if God desires his own son. Oh, a little knowledge, a little imagination, a little fellow feeling, as it were, brotherly, sisterly feeling. And we see, hear and feel how the Lord continually faced trials and temptations, one we've, ones we face and one we never will. I would never be tempted to jump off the top of the shard or something in order for an angel to pop out of somewhere. Yeah, that's, that's never going to be, be me. Um, sorry, I'm still imagining myself on top of the shard because I couldn't remember the name of the place. And <laughs> <laughs> I had it in mind, but, uh, but anyway, completely lost the plot. Um, but, but you, you know, just a little bit of imagination, uh, and we will know 
that our Lord faced things all the time and things that we will never face and face and face things that even that even that we do face to an extent that we never do because by and large the things we face are very often things we swiftly succumb to and yet there were things that he resisted to the end to the end to the uttermost that I never come near where I am vanquished and defeated he was victorious and conquering in our human nature for us and for our sakes he was in every respect every way Hebrew says tempted as we are tested yet without sin and Hebrews goes on to say that in the days of his flesh Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard because of his reverence and if you think this refers only to Gethsemane please think again the devil left Jesus for a brief moment a pause crotchet rest drew breath and went back to attack not least a little later when Jesus suffered a prophet's hometown welcome by the good old boys elsewhere called our lynch mob. The devil ne never left Jesus for long. He was in more or less constant attendance. But in the same place in scripture, in the same verse, Matthew also tells us of other attendants who were more, not less, constant. Angels came and were ministering to him. Uh, the service of God's angels never ceased. They remained in attendance upon the Son of God. Uh, I suppose in a way a bit like the Royal Guards outside Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle. You know, they're not constantly... Um, running after the Queen but they're there and if she called upon them well they would be there anyway we don't need to know how or when or where but their attention was something Jesus was assured of even though he never abused their humble submission and mighty service because he didn't in the temptations did he Matthew 4 and Luke 2 and not even when Jesus, Judas turned up in Gethsemane with a great crowd with swords and clubs. <laughs> Do you remember Jesus' rebuke for Peter? For that clumsy headstroke. Not that Jesus was criticising Peter's swordsmanship, but the very business of having a sword and using it. But Jesus' rebuke for that clumsy stroke with a concealed sword. Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say this must be. Jesus is fulfilling those ends in the scriptures, bringing them to completion, filling them out to the full in his life and in his death. And so in this way, at two moments of monumental trial, one at the start and the other near the finish of Jesus' redeeming work, Matthew, as it were, frames, brackets the Lord's life with the attentive attendance of angels. And you may recall that although Jesus, as his death approached, never called on the heavenly host that had greeted his birth, nonetheless the Father did not leave his Son unattended. Luke, who records the agony in the garden with all the acuity of a good doctor, also recalls the assistance of the angels. And there appeared to Jesus an angel from heaven strengthening him Luke 22 43 and in that strength Jesus prayed all the more earnestly and for the saviour of the world thank God the temptation to dodge suffering headed for the exit 
even as for careless prayerless disciples it came through the door they'd left open. Our Lord Jesus Christ entered the world as no one has ever entered it. He was announced by angels. Our Lord Jesus Christ lived in the world as no one has ever lived in it. He was attended by angels and our Lord Jesus Christ left the world as no one has ever left it. He was accompanied by angels. And that, that, that's a third telling with a fourth and final part is for another day because this is the evening of that singular day when Jesus to save us declined, declined the attentive attendance of heaven's angels. Oh, wouldn't they have loved to have done something, intervened, <laughs> in order to go and make heaven's peace on earth by the blood of his cross, as Paul says in Colossians 1.20, and do for us what absolutely no angel, no matter high, how high, great, almighty they are, could ever do for us. Well, Henry M Millman's um, Palm Sunday hymn that uh, Chris uh, used, if I remember rightly, Chris, I hope, um, on Palm Sunday, uh, becomes all the more poignant and powerful as we leave the palmy fronds behind and see the th thorny crown appear. Almost uniquely, it paints before our eyes uh, the sight of an army, an army only able to be an audience and no more powerless, not so much to intervene as to as to save, because that army, not a single angel or all of them, can be the saviour of the world, only Jesus can, and in the weakness of the cross, his power is to their wonder and to ours fully, completely displayed, as Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 1 verses 18 to 25. So I'm going to read the words of Rydon, Rydon in Majesty. Um, I, I'm hoping to play us out, but I have a horrible feeling I'm going to make a right muck of um, <laughs> what I played in and then mixed and added to and all the rest of it. Horrible feeling it's going to go horribly wrong. Uh, but before I do that we will pray. So ride on, ride on in majesty as all the crowds Hosanna cry through waving branches slowly ride O Saviour to be crucified. Ride on, ride on in majesty, in lowly pomp, ride on to die. O Christ, your triumph now begin with captured death and conquered sin. Ride on, ride on in majesty, the angel armies of the skies look down with sad and wandering eyes to see the approaching sacrifice. Ride on, ride on in majesty, the last and fiercest foe defy sin, death, devil, grave. The father on his sapphire throne awaits his own anointed son. Ride on, ride on in majesty in lowly pomp, ride on to die from this evening, from the upper room, from the garden. Bow your meek head to mortal pain. Then take, O oh God, your power and reign. This night, my Lord, if I sleep, in you let me rest. This night, my Lord, if I wake, with you let me keep watch. This night, my Lord, you stayed awake so that I might rest and abide in you forever. This night, my Lord, you stayed strong where I am weak. 
This night, my Lord, you overcame where I am overcome. This night, my Lord, you were sorrowful unto death, that I might rejoice in eternal life. My Lord Jesus Christ, through you and for you, all things were created in heaven and on earth, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Yet for the little while in which you entered the world and lived and died for it, you were made a little lower than the angels. My Lord, whom angels worship, you tasted death to deliver us from the dominion of death. May we see you now, crowned with glory and honour upon your Father's throne, surrounded by the hosts of heaven, as every eye shall see you on that rejoicing day, when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you are the Lord. You are the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. And I hope to meet you again tomorrow with Good Friday and on Easter Day. And until then, May the Lord be with you. And as I was taught to pray as a small boy, Lord, keep us safe this night, secure from all our fears. May angels guard us while we sleep till morning light appears.